So we're going to go a little into um, how we do storage. I think uh, Sherdeep actually went, went through a little bit already, hey, but um, this is deep dive. So we'll see. Hey, um, so th there are basically three types of storage in uh, Cloud Stack, and two of them we're really trying to merge. Uh, the first one is our primary storage. You know, that, that is actually connected to the compute servers and, and, um, and, the, uh, 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 and the clusters. And they, they provide the block storage for, for, the, for the VM, the block devices for the VM. Um, and then the other, the other one is our secondary storage. And secondary storage is basically where we store our templates, our ISOs, and, um, and also all of our uh, snapshot archiving. And a majority is the snapshot archiving that, 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 that is in, in, in this um, storage here. And the third one that we introduced in uh, uh, 3.0 is the object store. Uh, an object store would be um, the, and the secondary storage is inside a particular zone, whereas the object store is actually a, uh, outside of the zone, would be available between zones. Um, so let's go through the kind of the different characteristics. X. So, no, 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 three types. Uh, so, Cloud Stack supports two types. Uh, mainly, and, and I say that because secondary and object store, we're actually trying to get, get it to the point where, where uh, they, they merge together. Um, so, for primary storage, it's a block device. Uh, the main thing thing about primary storage is it has to be high on IOPS because this is where your VMs are running. And, and so, um, this is the place where you have to spend your money to make sure that, uh, uh, that it, it can support the, the needs of the VM. Um, whereas the secondary storage is a warm storage. You know, write once, read many times. Um, and, and so that actually maps very well to the, to, to the object store uh, concept. And we're trying to get it to the point where we have object store backing. And, and we integrated Swift, and I'll talk about, talk about that a little bit. Um, and secondary storage uh, is, that's biggest uh, characteristics is that you have to be able to add capacity to it. Um, uh, because if you're doing snapshotting and you're archiving and doing recurring snapshots, it's gonna go up really quickly in uh, the space. Uh, so uh, Cloud Stack uh, manages the storage between these two uh, uh, to get the maximum benefit for, 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 our, uh, um, for our operators. Uh, um, so <coughs> this offering is how we uh, show the um, how, how an operator would use uh, would show the end, um, end users that this is um, th this is the, this type of disk you're, you're using. It has things like size and, and, and things like that to to uh, show. Oh, this is the this is the disk. And our service offering it, um, in Cloud Stack actually contains a disk offering for the root disk. That that's actually something that most people do not know. Um, so our service offering contains CPU and memory, but it also is a um, uh, disk characteristics for, for, for the root disk. Question? Oh, go ahead. So we've uh, actually been working with your architecture team on attaching stand-based LUN, the same LUN to a cluster of servers. Uh, however, importing that storage repository ends up with duplicates and it doesn't show up as shared storage, it shows up as local. Uh, so we forego actually importing that. Is there going to be uh, some usage or, or some amendment in a way to use uh, shared SAM storage? Oh, oops. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. They're trying to use the same time. <laughs> Uh, so the, the question was about using SAN attached uh, or fiber attached storage on a cluster of servers and this being not attaching a unique LUN to each server but using a shared LUN across a, a cluster of servers for consistency and then treating it as shared storage rather than uh, uh, an individual storage for each node. Right. When we imported that storage into CloudStack, uh, it messed around with our calculations because it thought that the, you know, five terabyte volume that was attached to all nodes was actually an individual five terabyte for each system, um, and it didn't allow us to use it in a shared storage uh, methodology. Uh, w was this on KVM? This was on Zen server. On Zen server. Mm, okay, I would say that's a bug on Zen server. Uh, so, oh, uh, you you did a SR that was shared. 
Yeah, from the Zen server uh, management, uh, Zen console, it works fine. We can move VMs around, and, and it, we're using the Zen. I forget. There's a, an actual Zen tool that that allows you to move VMs around. It was when we used CloudStack to interact with the SAN attached uh, fiber storage that uh, a lot of things didn't go right. Uh, CloudStack didn't have a good understanding of what was going on from the storage perspective and treated okay. it as local rather than shared. Okay. Uh, uh, um yeah, so we actually have uh, people who have SAN and storage attached to SAN server, and it does come up as a, as a shared storage for us. Uh, so I, I'm not sure about your specific case. Uh, so we, can, we can go look at that and see what it is. As, um, the, uh, uh, it should be as long as uh, SAN server recognizes it as shared storage, then we, we recognize it as shared storage. I, I think the difference in this case would be if you attach a unique LUN to each server, uh, it shows up fine. It's when you're sharing the same LUN um, across 10 servers, for instance, that there became a problem. Huh. And are you using LVM O yeah. HBR? Yep. Yeah, we have people who use exactly that case. So uh, yeah, I, we can look at it together uh, afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and for so uh, for cloud stack though, uh, the backend storage is is not important to us as long as the hypervisor can access it. Uh, uh, storage, then, then we don't uh, we don't do anything with that. Uh, we do allow people to do uh, tiering, tiering of this. Oh, yeah. So that's that's actually uh, yeah. So this offering has storage tags, which allows you to uh, do um, tiering of the storage. Uh, so basically, if you have um, a storage server that has SSD versus a storage server that just has regular regular disk, as um, you can actually add tags. And then add tags to the storage pools, and we will match the tags and uh, allow you to, um, to specify that. Uh, okay. So yeah, before we get to snapshots, I kind of want to talk about um, uh, templates and, and ISO. I don't have a slide on it because it's very straightforward. I think in, in the um, VM startup process, we've already uh, talked about uh, Cloud Stack. If it doesn't and we unseed the prime, uh, template on the primary storage. It will actually copy the template onto the primary storage, and then you and, and the VMs would be would be childs of that uh, 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 template. Uh, and we, we do that type of operation. And on template is stored on the secondary storage. We actually um, uh, raise up VMs to transfer them between zones if if it's not available in, in a certain zone. Um, we raise up VMs to allow you to be able to download the template into your into your um, uh, uh, own laptops if you if that's what it is uh, if that's what you want. Um, but the users themselves do not have direct access to the secondary storage or the primary storage. Uh, we 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 do these operations to, so that we can isolate the, the entire concept from from the end users. Uh, so for the end users, when they look at the VM, they they have a couple of disks. Yeah, uh, and then if they want to access anything that they, they have on secondary storage, they're basically asking CloudStack to provide you know, the URL to download, to copy, and things like that. And they, they have no idea what the secondary storage is. As um, all right. Mm. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. And so uh, when you look at snapshots, um, the, the idea of snapshot, people have different ideas of what snapshots are, uh, right? You can you be using snapshot as a recovery mechanism for the end user, uh, or you could be using it as a um, backup archive in case of primary storage failure, right? So it's, it's for the, uh, DRS. As, and so uh, in, in CloudStack, we, we Kind of merge them together, those those, those two ideas. As, but primarily, it is a uh, DRS for, for for the end user. Uh, and when you look at snapshots, to take the snapshot, it has very minimal effect on the VM. The VM, um, well, it depends on the hypervisor. Um, but uh, for sensor server, for VMware, it's very it's very straightforward. It's, it's a quick snapshot, uh, and then it is the backup process to move it for the for the DRS purpose. That that takes that depend that is dependent on how heavy your network is, how 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 much bandwidth your network has, and how how much workload you have on the on, on the network. But doing the move, the workload is not 
No, during the move, it's not because the snapshot is, has already been um, has already been created. Uh, The, uh, that, that really depends on how much you change on, on inside the VM. Yeah, it, then, then it's very small, yeah. Uh, I mean, and if, if what you have changed on the disk is you know, tens of megabytes, there, there would be a bit of overhead on top of that. If you have you know, uh, gigabytes, there's, I'm sure there's some percentage of overhead, but uh, it, it's not going to vary very much from what was changed. Yep. That's right, and we actually use um, the native native capabilities of uh, the hypervisor uh, in those cases. So a lot of these hypervisors um, is already built on the idea of of having child uh, uh, chains and things like that, uh, where it only requests the deltas. So when we when we take the snapshot, it's merely yeah, it's merely taking whatever those deltas are and, and taking it over to secondary storage. Any other questions? Yeah, so uh, snapshots, like I said, is meant and to be used as um, uh, backups uh, for, uh, uh, for DRS. As we take it on primary storage and we move it to the secondary storage, and then we will, we, we will uh, remove it from um, the primary storage. Um, uh, today, we do full snapshots on VMware and KVM. And KVM actually has uh, this problem where it may not be crash consistent when you take the snapshot. Uh, but that, that's, that's a problem with the hypervisor, not, uh, not, not with what we have. Uh, we need help on um, uh, adding incremental snapshots to these two hypervisors specifically. A, um, and we do incremental snapshots on SAN server. Um, Hello, one question. On OpenStack, when a virtual machine is being terminated, all the storage is uh, lost. What about on this uh, cloud stack? If so on I... cloud stack, that's not, that's not the case. The VM is actually persistent. So you, you stop the VM, the VM um, um, stays around, um, uh, the storage stays around for that VM. And, and so, so does all of its snapshots. So uh, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about our, uh, specifically the incremental snapshots and, and the strategies that we use. Those, uh, um, and of course, it can only be sense server because we only do it for sense server today. Uh, um, so on sense server, um, when you first copy over uh, the, the template, there's actually a base copy a, a file that's at the very top. Uh, and then you create a very small uh, reference to that base copy. And the reason why you create that is because you don't want the VM and the base copy to get coalesced into the same file. Uh, so if you have multiple VMs, um, space of the of the same template, then you actually will have multiple of these D1s that are base, that, that are pointing to the base copy, um, and so then and you take a snapshot, uh, the snapshot will be pointing to D1, and the process of uh, taking a snapshot on sense server is actually uh, creating this file, uh, creating the second delta file, uh, and and S1 will point to it, and because D1 has multiple childs, then the D1 and cannot be coalesced uh, to, uh, back to into the base copy. And, uh, and once we've done that, then we will copy D2, uh, sorry, we will copy D1 over to our secondary storage. Uh, uh, so the, uh, that th this would be the delta uh, uh, for, for exactly that. Uh, and then and on, the next cop uh, on the next snapshot, uh, S2 will, will be pointing to D2, and then they basically create this particular uh, disk for the VM um, to run on, and D2 would be persistent. Uh, and so then, and, uh, um, and then we copy D2 over, and we would delete S1. Once you delete S1, because D1 itself does not, uh, does not have multiple child, then D2 would be coll collapsed into D1. Um, because, uh, because you don't want too many of these chains. You, th this chain goes um, uh, further down, then to read something that, uh, that is only on the base copy, you actually have to hop from here to here to here to find something in, in, inside there. So this particular chain, and you do not want to uh, keep very long. Um, and in cloud stack, basically, you will always have a chain of three if you have snapshots. You, you will have a VM, 
one delta and the base copy uh, in cloud stack. Now over here, now that's what we kept on the primary storage, but those are not the snapshots that you use to recover the VMs. Um, um, that, that mainly is to prevent the hypervisor from, from collapsing and we no longer have this delta file to copy over. Um, so we, uh, we always have one snapshot, one, one delta file, and one base copy uh, left on, uh, on primary storage. Um, over here though, uh, in CloudStat what we take is, we take a full snapshot at the very beginning that, that's the entire VM. We copy it over. We take the deltas. Uh, and every so often, we will take another full copy. And we will take deltas uh, uh, of that. Uh, and if the number of uh, old copies have to uh, goes away, then, and then things like here, this entire chain will, will disappear and get deleted uh, from, from, from the secondary storage. Uh, so the requirement for storing on the, uh, for the snapshots on secondary storage is actually uh, higher than just the number of snapshots you set to, uh, to keep around. Because you might have to keep around this entire chain in order to access this particular snapshot. Whereas these are, has already been deleted and is not accessible by the, by, by the user. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, absolutely, because uh, what this restore means is, let's say they, they want to take this snapshot and restore this particular one. And this snap, the, the restoration process is, is we would take, go from here and make a copy of everything in here back into the primary storage. So it, it, it basically would be another template copy in that, in, in that case. It, it will take longer than, than a normal start. Yeah, this is very different from, uh, you know, from VMware Workstation, where you can take a lot of snapshots and, and revert back very quickly. And, and this, th this is really modeled after like Amazon EC2, where a, right. a snapshot is a backup. Yeah, that, that, that's why, oh, what did I do? Oh, wrong button. Oh, no. I have to go through all that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was the last slide. I, I was going to show, um, uh, uh, show, show some of our code. Oh well. Anyways, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in in the picture, uh, in in our in, in the slide about snapshots, I was saying, and we use it as a backup uh, a purpose. It's it's not meant for someone to snapshot and immediately revert back. Uh, uh, so. Yeah. yeah question. So you said that VMware doesn't do incremental snapshots. What would that look like in that picture? Yeah, so it's not that VMware doesn't do incremental snapshots. It's that CloudStack does not support the backups of, of, of those snapshots onto secondary storage. So every time, it is a full snapshot that gets stored on the, on the secondary storage. Oh, yeah, that wasn't the last slide. Uh, so uh, we, we have been talking about um, uh, making some architectural changes to how we do storage. Um, uh, one particular thing is last item, but, but it's actually a, uh, something that's important to me is that uh, we, we today do not have a plugin architecture for people to define storage. Uh, everything is one particular uh, uh, way to get, get, get to storage. Now we, we do have the ability to say set up these storage networks so people can actually access the server inside the VM. Um, but, it, but we have not put in things like uh, what I really want to do is for CloudStack to provision a LUN that is used only by a particular uh, VM. Um, um, so it, it, I, I would very much like to see a, um, uh, a plug-in architecture for, for storage. Um, and another um, problem that we have is uh, secondary storage uh, is not is tied to the entire zone. So that, that if we go back to this slide, I, this guy is, is always tied to the zone. Um, and the problem is that when you're doing recurring snapshots as, as backup, then the stress that you put at this layer three switch with the number of VMs that we're talking about is actually quite high. 
I, I, I'll, uh, I'll come to that. Uh, so then, um, so uh, we've, been, we've been talking about the idea that uh, secondary storage needs to be multi-homed into each part. So, so that the, the, there's, uh, it has one interface in each part. And then you can provide a backup network that is only local to that part without going to the core switch uh, for that data to go, to go into the secondary storage. Um, and then and, and another idea is that we need, to, we need to provide direct access to storage. This is the, the, the idea about being able to do one run directly into, uh, for, for enterprise uh, deployments. And, sorry. Uh, so uh, for an enterprise, uh, this type of backup methodology is not going to meet a private cloud need in an enterprise. Um, such things as VTL or other long-term storage uh, methodology needs to be used to meet compliance as well as to meet more advanced business use cases. Right. Um, is there any discussions about integrating with like open VTL or some, some other? Um, I, I don't know the technology itself, but there's actually a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of discussion regarding that because we do believe this, this is not right for enterprise. Uh, or at least I believe now. You, you need to voice your opinion more. <laughs> and help and me we'll out. Accept patches. Um, so Alex, another question, real quick. Uh, going back to to your VMware snapshot discussion, um, is there a technical reason that we don't support that that incremental, or it just hasn't been written? Or I'm looking for a face in the crowd here, and he's not here, man. Okay, yeah. So our VMware uh, uh, expert. Uh, right. He, uh, my understanding from, from him is that um, VMware takes number one takes these uh, snapshots at a VM basis. So we have to identify the volume in, 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 in. So when you look at when you look at uh, Sense Server, each one of these all, when when you take it on primary storage is already volume based. Whereas um, uh, VMware, uh, this this is actually VM based. This is one big VM, and then there's different volumes inside. I, and so then there's a lot of difficulty in extracting those bikes, bikes um, for, for that particular VM. Um, and so that, that, that's our problem on, on, on that particular implementation. Okay. Any questions or comments? All right. So. So I actually got, um, I, I kind of knew this was not uh, very long um, uh, in duration and of a speech so or, or a presentation. And so I got a lot of questions about taking a look at our code. Oh, oh, so I'll, I'll use the next half an hour to kind of give, a, um, give an idea of what our code looks like. Uh, can I get it on the laptop? Thank you. Well, that's coming up. The individual hosts are uh, booting off of local disk, right? And it's the VMs that are booting off of NFS or iSCSI or, that's right. or some other available. Well, I mean, you, you could uh, do as such that, that uh, the hosts themselves boot off some sort of network storage. Uh -huh. we, we have no... That's outside of your purview. Yeah, at point. yeah exactly. We, 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 don't, we don't care uh, about that. Okay. And Matt, I've seen uh, I've seen some folks who are pixie booting their hypervisors, yeah. as well as doing USB. Uh, you know, they're doing either that USB or SD yeah. slot to to boot uh, the actual hypervisor OS itself. No. Okay. So I'll just you'll be able to there. do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I need this for my home. All right, so yeah, I, I, I just started to realize my eyes are kind of growing old, so this, this would be nice. Eyes, um, 
let's go over take a, and take a look at our projects. That's all I can do. Thanks. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So actually, this this would be a nice um, uh, continuation of the talk we had before lunch. And so in CloudStack, we set up these compilation boundaries to make sure that we, we don't cross us and we're not actually diluting each other's code. Uh, um, for when you look at CloudStack's code, the, the first thing you always want to look at, uh, um, well, actually, you sh hopefully you don't ever have to look in here, but um, this is the first, first dependency in our, in our compilation. And, and this is like co Google Commons or, or utilities that, that we have uh, for ourselves. Uh, and then um, our API package is the, is the next in the dependency. And here, if I get to figure out how to expand it, is basically all of our, our APIs. Uh, and the things in here are, are interfaces that you can, you, you, you can implement and uh, web services APIs that has been implemented at uh, commands and, and agent commands. And if you're interested in looking at agent commands, they are all here. Um, so, so these are the commands that are being sent to the different resources. So if I just look at one of them, attach volume, um, you can see these are very clean um, uh, classes because all, all they are is, is used to be, these, these are basically stubs to be translated into JSON. Uh, to be transferred over. So very straightforward, uh, things like that. Uh, so now let's look at some of the interfaces that we actually have. So if you want to do an event, you can take the Windows key and the plus sign and it'll magnify 200 times so everybody in the back can see it. Oh, people can't see it? Sorry. <laughs> Where's the plus button on here? Uh, up by the oh. zero. There's a laptop, so uh, so there's no plus. So if you, if you hold, Control, oh, you yeah. don't have a Windows key. I, don't, I, have one. <laughs> I have Windows key. I just don't know where the plus. Um, it didn't work. It's not working. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, oh, okay. oh, there we go. Cool. Right. Hey. Okay. So, uh, this is our network element interface. And now, I don't know how to scroll down. Okay. Hey. So a uh, network element gets called at uh, various stage of a VM start and a network creation. And, and so for example, the implement and method is called when the conceptual network that we present to the end user requires to be physically created on, uh, uh, on the network. Uh, so for example, uh, we have VLAN at that time, um, we, we allocate a VLAN to the end user, and then we actually garbage collect it when he no longer needs it. Uh, so uh, during that transition between the two, we will inform the uh, network elements and says, look, you, this network is being implemented. You need to do whatever you need to do to, to make sure that you can interface with that particular network. And, and carry inside the network would be things like our, um, would, would be things like VLAN and, and um, Inside the so 
So this is an interface that, uh, that allows you to define things like right, what type of broadcast domain and um, uh, what kind of IP address you, it should be on here, uh, the traffic types, the gateway that you have, you know, the seeder. And I think uh, with this expansion, I have a problem with uh, showing the rest of the file. Do I do minus? No, apparently not. See, it exposes me as a presentation newbie. So, so anyway, so you have to bear with me here for this. For this. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, basically things that defines the network in, in, in um, a typical L2 network. Uh, uh, so then we, we'll, we will tell the network uh, um, uh, elements, look, your, this network is being implemented. Uh, this was the network offering that that was um, uh, uh, that this network is based on. Um, this is the deploy destination for the for, for the network, uh, meaning that uh, this is the when when we start the VM, um, this is the uh, destination with the host and data center and pod uh, things like that 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 gets. Um, yeah, data center, pod, cluster, host. Oh, and the storage for its disks as uh, that the VM is destined and to go to. Um, and then there's a reservation context that, that gives you uh, some um, um, VM, uh, sorry, uh, the user who, who's making this call and, um, and, and, and a unique ident identifier for, for, for this particular um, uh, process. And then once the network has been created, then, then we would, we would call the network element and tell it, look, you need to prepare for this particular NIC profile uh, uh, to, to come into the network. Uh, this NIC profile belongs to this particular virtual machine. Again, the, the, the deployed destination. And, and, okay, okay, yeah, and the reservation context. Uh, and so uh, at this point, then, we're, we're informing you about the VM itself. Uh, and when the VM is stopped, then we will tell the network elements, look, this VM is going away. A, you need to release whatever resource that, you, that you've uh, done for this. Uh, and then when the network itself no longer has any VM running on it, uh, then it's time to garbage collect that the resources re reallocated to that network. And we, we, will tell it, we will tell each network element when, when we do that that this network is being uh, shut down. Um, and again, also when, when the network itself is totally being destroyed, just in case the network element has any references as to, to, to this network uh, storage. And there's probably some stuff down there, but maybe not important. But, but you can see that this is basically a, a us informing the network elements and, and that code what happens. Uh, excuse me. Uh, my question is: uh, You don't expect committers to ever change any APIs in this module, I'm, or I'm do sorry? you? Uh, <clears throat> do you expect committers to change APIs in this module? In this module, do I expect to change the APIs? Yes. Yeah, it, it is possible to change the APIs. So. Okay. Uh, then my question would be. Uh, this uh, module contains APIs from different levels. So uh, then if, for example, you just change uh, agent APIs, you would have to recompile, for example, web services APIs as well. If I just change the agent APIs, how do we compile the web services? I'm not sure I understand. Uh, they, they're all in the same uh, package. The, ah, in the no. Same no, no, no. So, okay. So, I, 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 see, I see what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, so, actually, what we expect is that everyone would work on this API. I, mm, look, okay, let me, let me roll back a little bit. Uh, so, for the network element, if you are changing API inside the network element interface, yes, what, what, you, what you're saying is correct. We do, have to, we do expect everyone else to, to make that change. But that's something that we will have to agree on, on and says it makes sense at the interface level. Now, if you have, what, what you have is actually 
a uh, API that you need to configure your particular implementation of the network element, that, that's, not, that's not going to be at this interface. Uh, that actually is a completely different uh, way of doing it. Uh, um, let me bring that up. So we have this, this idea of the pluggable servers that I mentioned before. And why does it every time it expands, it goes over here? Okay. Uh, where, okay, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. If you look at this, th this is our list of web services APIs that we, that we support, right? That, that is exposed by CloudStack. And, and it's very simple to, to go through it because as whatever you send over the wire to create accounts translates to this particular class. Okay, hey, and let's go into that a little bit. So it translates into this class, and this, this basically describes uh, the over-the-wire uh, parameters in, in that REST call. Um, and, it, and, and we will deserialize it into this class. And, and then the class will call execute somewhere down here. Um, and, and that translates into a Java API call that, that comes down. Um, now, uh, so that's already very dynamic because um, uh, it's, all, it's all just a... Uh, yeah, it's all just in, in, in one particular uh, uh, .properties file where we have all, all of those types of mappings. And so you can see that in here, right? And what the pluggable service does give to, give, give to us is that we ask you for your list of command properties. As that, that does that mapping. And, and when you expose this to CloudStack, then CloudStack would actually gather that and accept those commands as CloudStack's commands. And it will know to get, will direct it over to your code and your code can make the executions. So things like configuration and web services API, you expose yourself. Uh, uh, the network element um, is actually an interface between CloudStack kernel and, and, your, and your code about what CloudStack kernel needs from your implementation. And so then you wouldn't make changes to network element just, just to configure your, your code. Or else then it's, it's a big mess. <laughs> to configure yours, if you need APC, everybody needs APC. Yeah. Uh, so let's take a look at Network Guru. So uh, um, I explained a little bit earlier this morning that Network Guru is is the way for us to design different networks or, or do. Uh, define one conceptual network and how it's actually implemented in the physical network. Uh, so uh, what happens is when you say, I want to create this particular network, uh, we will ask the network group, can you design a network uh, based on the network offering and that, that, that is here. Um, and when, once that's returned, we will, we will persist that into, in, 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 into the cloud stack database. And we will always ref, refer to this particular network group because, because um, uh, the different implement, uh, this implementation would, is specifically for that type of network. Uh, and when it's time for us to actually implement that network, meaning and actually uh, allocate the physical resources for, for, uh, to support that particular network, then we will call the implement in, uh, method and says, as this was the network that you returned back to me before, or um, this is uh, the network offering and that was on, I want to deploy to this destination, go, go and implement it. And it, it, it might be just as simple as, as you go to your, da your, your, your database tables and says, oh, find, find the VLAN that sends out. And, and a lot of our code actually, that's what it does. Uh, but it also might be, at this point, you need to contact your resource to verify that underneath, there, there is enough capacity to, to, to implement this particular network. Uh, uh, so, so you can get it uh, uh, quite complicated or it could be uh, quite simple. Um, depends on how you want to do it. 
And then uh, for each particular VM, um, remember in the, uh, this, this, this morning when, when, um, on the deploy IVM, it's actually broken into two, two particular parts. One part is to allocate, which means all, all we really want is some database entities is um, uh, to, to, to be persistent. And so uh, the network guru has this allocate call that basically tells you we're, we're creating this conceptual old NIC. Right? You need to figure out uh, what, what exactly par uh, parameters you need to place in this NIC right? at, at this point. It might be nothing right? because maybe everything you do is actually at the VM start, uh, which would be perfectly fine. Just return us an empty NIC and, and we'll just store that information in and, and we will call you again with what, with what you sent us. Uh, and when the VM actually starts, then we will call this reserve method and says, uh, now you need to reserve some um, resources for this particular NIC. Uh, and if you did it uh, at the allocate time, then you do nothing here, which is perfectly fine. As long as the information that needs, that are um, needed for that particular VM to participate in the network is, is, in, is, is in, their, in this process, then we're, 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 we're fine with it. Uh, and when VM is stopped, we will tell the guru, look, now you can re release whatever resource you can, you need to, um, uh, uh, that, that you allocated to this particular NIC. And when the VM is being destroyed and completely uh, uh, eradicated from our database, we, we will also tell the guru, uh, whatever you need to do to, to figure that out. And the same thing when uh, again, when the VM, when, when the when all VMs have evacuated a network, then uh, we need to shut down the network to collect its um, uh, resources. We will call the shutdown method. Uh, yeah, and and trash and I think update network profile is is to update it at, with some inf the information only this network guru knows so that we send that back to the end user. Our, um, uh, so this, this is for extra capabilities or extra information that only the guru is storing for a particular network. And I can't get to the bottom, but I think the rest of it is not, is not quite important. Um, so that, that would be the network guru uh, uh, interface. Is it time yet, Shady? For your talk? I think I'm scheduled to end at 2.30. There we go. 216, okay, still got 15 minutes. Oh, okay, so, so here's the bottom part of that, which is uh, get, get the traffic types that you support, uh, and is this the traffic type that you actually support? So in Cloud Stack, I think you might have took a, saw a glimpse of this in, um, at the very top here. So these are the traffic types that, that um, CloudStack supports. So uh, CloudStack, uh, 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 I shared did mention uh, early this morning, and CloudStack makes a, a um, big effort to make sure that we are not in the data path. And in order to do that, we have to understand how, how traffic flows inside a data center. Uh, and these are the uh, types of traffic that we believe we are, are inside a particular data center. Um, uh, is um, public egg, egg traffic, egg, whether it's traffic only for that particular gas. Uh, uh, storage is a little bit misnamed here because this, this is not really a storage traffic type, but more a backup traffic type. Uh, ba how, 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 how are you going to transport the snapshot to, to, to the secondary storage? Um, there is um, uh, management and control is, is very similar to management, and then there's also VPN traffic. I, I, to, to connect back to a um, uh, user's uh, 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 data center back into office, for example. Um, uh, so, so we try to understand how, what, what network actually carries, this inf uh, uh, carries all these type of different traffic types. So that when someone says, I want to bring up a VM and it does 
su such and such, and what I really need is, is storage, or what I really need is uh, uh, to be plugged into the guest traffic somehow, uh, we know how to uh, plug that in and, and for, uh, for, for people who are talking to us. Any questions? Or is it confusing? <laughs> no? On storage pool? Storage? What do you mean? Oh, no, I, we, we already did the storage deep dive. And I figure well, I'll use the rest of the time to kind of show a little bit of code. Oh, it's not on mine? I don't know. Hello? So that's at 2.30? Oh, that's 2 to 3. Oh. Uh, one question here. Yeah. So I'm looking at the network.java class. Uh, so there is a public static class provider where there are these um, external DHCP server, gateway, and all that. Right? I think you need to hold the mic a little closer. Okay. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out where I should uh, actually change the code, uh, whether it's going to be new classes that I write and somehow they get plugged into the right the cloud stack thing uh, by means of changing the components of XML, right? Right. That's one thing. But do I, do I ever have to change this provider class here? Say about there is a public static class provider within the network.java where I see Juniper SRX, F5, Big IP, and all that. So these kind of look like, uh, to me, they sound like uh, some provider implementations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they it should is. be pluggable um, in the sense, I shouldn't be needing to change this this class, network.java, which is my understand, understanding correct? Well, you, you shouldn't have to change anything in the, in, in the uh, API package. Uh, now, I mean, it's possible that we, we miss the functionality here and there, and then, and then in that case, then we, we should we, we should propose that to the community and and says we we need this on the interface, but your implementation itself should not require that. Uh, just this is part of API, right? Which one? Ah, I see. Let's let's bring that up then. Yeah, it did. Oh, it does. Okay, great. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to get that up there. Yeah, so, uh, you're, you're talking about specifically this, right? Right. Yeah. So, so this is not a enum. This is just a uh, const class. So, you can declare that const class yourself in, inside, your, inside your own code. Now, and in fact, mo most of this shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be here. They should be re residing with each in individual uh, configuration. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this is just a way for us to say, oh, uh, for this provider, uh, what are the services that are supported uh, here? Uh, I guess. Nope. Plus the and and then for each service what are the capabilities that 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 uh, you can you can support uh, so for example for low balancer then you should be able to say hey um, what type of stickiness methods it, it, it supports things like that uh, so then you can create that because we specifically took um, uh, did not put this as a enum because we don't want people to change this file we want to we want you to put those capabilities along with your your own code. Uh, and some people have put it in here uh, today because because most of this right now has been written by us, and that, that that's actually incorrect. Yeah. Say, for example, if I'm writing an implementation for uh, actually providing the physical uh, networking, right? Uh, so the, you showed me this class network guru where there is a implement uh, method. You give a network and then say go and implement, right? So would I be would I be providing a network guru 
Customer yeah, if you, group? if what you have is that in, in that network needs to deal with IP addressing and network isolation, how to implement network isolation and, and IP addresses, then you would need to provide a network guru. Uh, if what you need to do is just provide services, then you, you, you only need to implement a network element. And sometimes it's both. So I think, I think um, uh, for example, OVS would, would, would actually have both. Oh, is the OBS code in here? Yeah, OBS Where? This one? Yeah. yeah. So you, you see, uh, uh, OBS would implement a network guru, uh, and then at the same time, it also. Implement a network element because it, it needed it needed to per, to ensure um, the service of uh, isolation and as well as, uh, as as well as providing the IP address schemes and things like that. Oh, okay, so I, I was supposed to do high availability, huh? I'll let, give me give me a minute. So I didn't have a presentation for for this because uh, we actually written a doc for it. So uh, a, um, I was talking this morning about high availability manager acting kind of a, as a, as a special service on top of uh, the cloud stack kernel. Uh, and well, what it, what it does is that uh, if a VM uh, is stopped out of band, or if a host may have um, gone down um, or is disconnected, uh, then what we do is we file these VMs with the high availability, uh, high availability manager and says, you're responsible for telling me whether or not this particular VM can be started. Uh, and so then and HA goes through this particular uh, set of um, uh, code states. So for high availability, uh, the HA basically implements uh, three different um, processes as, or uh, three steps in the single process. The first thing it does is it investigates on whether or not the VM is actually down, um, right? If, if you conceptually think about that, that um, uh, and then once it, once it determines whether or not the VM is down or not, then it needs to figure out whether or not it can fence off the VM from using the disk or using the network. Or, once it has fenced off the VM, then it can actually start the VM. Um, and and the, the, the reason why we need to do that is because uh, for, for fencing off is because you don't want two VM instances to write to the same disk, which would then corrupt the actual disk. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a flow for HA. I, that says, as, um, since you file the VM for, for HA, has the VM state changed? And since, since it was filed, meaning that has someone actually went through CloudStack API or something like that to, to start the VM. Um, and if it has, then we're going to cancel the work because there's no reason for us to try to HA the VM because someone else is already dealing with it. Uh, uh, but if it hasn't, then we, we look at and says, oh, does is investigation needed for, for this particular VM? Because uh, when it was, um, uh, schedule with the high availability manager, uh, it might have been that we just simply didn't know what, what was that VM doing and what was the state of the VM. 
Um, and and there are a lot of different ways for us to uh, to understand and uh, what is the VM um, uh, current state. So, for example, we could we could uh, do a ping of the VM. Um, we could um, uh, ping it from Dalmar, or we could uh, actually look at uh, look at the host and says as is the VM around or not. Uh, but the key to uh, to to um, doing this is that. Uh, HA manager is not responsible for figuring out what it is. It's figuring out to do that process. It's figuring. It, it, it's responsible for going, making sure that process got executed. And but the ways to do the uh, to do that is through what we call investigator plugins, and where it has some um, logic that says I know how to do this ping, or I know how to talk to IPMI and make sure that the host is actually down. Um, um, and we go talk to the investigators uh, and says, well, can you figure out what, whether or not the VM is down? And the investigator can return basically three stakes. It can say, nope, the VM is up, up, or the VM is down, or I do not know. Oh, and if the VM is up, then we, we, will, um, we, we will actually go back and say, uh, the VM is now up. Uh, if, it, if the VM is down, then we will move on to To the start, the start VM state. But if it is unknown, then we will move on to the next investigator, or uh, until all the investor investigators are gone, on uh, are, are done. Um, so, but if all of the investigators says, as uh, I don't know what is the state of the VM, then we will talk to another plugin that says, oh, I'm the I, I know how to fence off a VM, um, and. And we will ask them to try to fen attempt to fence off the VM. Um, if the if none of the fencers, and again, and a HA manager is only responsible for making sure this step was done. It's not responsible for doing this particular step. Uh, uh, so then, and the fencer says, as uh, yes, I can actually uh, fence off the VM. Then once again, we will go up to to start start the VM. Um, but if it says no, then we will we will talk to um, more fencers, and and if all the fencers are gone, then we will reschedule this because there's no safe way for us to actually HA the VM. Um, so we will reschedule this work to be done on on ten minutes later, for example. Oh, uh, and we will it, we 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 do this particular work. Uh, uh, but if the fencer or if we have complete determined that the VM is definitely down. Then we will go through the normal process of starting the VM, and all of this is executed through the kernel. Our, our HA manager doesn't actually understand how to start the VM. All, all I can do is tell I'll, I'll tell the kernel, "Look, I, I have been sure that the VM is either down or has been fenced. Now you go go back and start that particular VM." Um, so this is our um, kind of the high availability process inside CloudStack, and I wanted to demonstrate that because this this would be a more you know, I, what I expect is that there's people who write more and more apps or, or, or uh, operations like this on top of CloudStack to orchestrate um, and deal with different problems that uh, that um, uh, an administrator uh, needs to deal, a system administrator needs to deal with through CloudStack. Because CloudStack is an orchestration engine, and and there's going to be more people who can imagine the type of things that they can they, they can do on top for the for the VM underneath. Uh, any questions? Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, we, we are moving toward the idea uh, that uh, if the uh, hypervisor itself have native HA capabilities, then we will uh, let the hypervisor themselves uh, do the HA. Uh, uh, and, and we just work with that uh, HA mechanism. Um, um, uh, and HAA in CloudStack would be more on a, a grander scale, meaning a cluster has failed, and what happens? And, and we orchestrate those, those type of things, things outside of the um, um, management of the, uh, of the hypervisors. 